All right, hello everybody. Um, I saw this giant room they scheduled us for for a talk on DNS. It was a little surprise, but actually it's filling up not too bad. Um, my name is John Bellamerick. Uh, I'm from Google, and this is uh, Yang. You want to introduce yourself, or I'll just it'll be a long story. So Yang uh, is at Avanti, and um, we are here to talk about Core DNS. Um, so, what is Core DNS? I don't know how many of you actually. Are familiar? I mean, if you've been using Kubernetes, you may have been using it without knowing it. How many are you familiar with, with Core DNS? That's pretty good. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, when, when uh, Kubernetes first started, uh, it, in, it had a very strange DNS implementation that included um, sort of a DNS mask running in a, in a pod along with etcd running in the same pod and a special controller that wrote the DNS config file, DNS mask config files so that it could serve up things. And, and um, Yang and I at the time were at a, a company called Infoblox, which some of you may know. And, uh, and we, we were like, this is insane. And so we, um, our, our, uh, our chief uh, DNS guy there, uh, Cricket Lou, he, he hooked us up with somebody at Google who had been building a, um, this core DNS thing. We're like, what is this thing? So we actually worked with him, and we, we worked to get it uh, integrated with Kubernetes so that instead of having these three processes all running in a pod and sort of a lot of failure points and other issues, um, we had a single process that talked directly to the Kube API server um, and, of course, does a lot of other things. So the, the whole goal behind it wasn't just to work with Kubernetes, but to work with... Um, in, in general, in cloud-native ecosystems. At this time, of course, Kubernetes wasn't the only uh, container orchestrator uh, of, of uh, merit. And so uh, we intended to integrate with others, but, but of course, Kubernetes won. Uh, and we primarily do Kubernetes now, although we also integrate and people use it as just an ordinary DNS server. So hopefully, you can check it out for some of that, that as well. Um, the, the idea is instead of just serving based on you know, traditional zone files, you can serve up DNS from anywhere, from any source. Uh, and then you can also put uh, plugins within the request processing pipeline of the DNS request so that you can do interesting and novel things that are really challenging to do in traditional DNS servers. So architecturally, uh, we wrote it in Go, or you know, the Meek, who first wrote it, wrote it in Go, and we, we enhanced it. Um, and as a community, we've continued uh, to enhance it over, over the last few years. Um, service discovery, with or without Kubernetes, is a focus, but not the only thing we do. Um, that plugin architecture allows us to do interesting things. Um, we also added some, being, being sort of trying to do novel things and, and experiment and see where things are going in the future, which is, it kind of provides an excellent base for that. We, we did some n new and novel things like DNS over gRPC. That's not a standard. That is a core DNS thing. Um, but actually, people use it. And you could do really interesting things like pass you know, um, uh, distributed tracing spans across your DNS if you use that. And so you can kind of get visibility into your entire request flow, including the DNS portion, in ways that you really couldn't before. And you can also use it to integrate with policy engines, which is something we do as well. Um, the, the other integration that probably is more commonly used to, other than file and Kubernetes are the ones to the cloud providers. So essentially, we can provide, and we'll show some more detail on this in a little bit, but you can use the same DNS server, Core DNS, to uh, front for zones in any of your different clouds. And so you, you kind of can bring everything together in one, in one place there. Um, so we do have 350 contributors. Um, we have a lot of folks who've, because it's a plugin architecture, what, what will happen is somebody will have a particular interest uh, and they'll develop a particular plugin, and then they can, you know, obviously they become a contributor. But if they're really interested in continuing on and maintaining and owning that plugin, then they can they can become a maintainer as well. So it's a, although 350 is uh, a large number, it actually is a pretty small community. Um, and so, you know, we'd love to have any of you come and join us. Uh, we, we, you know, recently we have. Like I said, mostly contributions around individual plugins. There's some bigger things we'd like to do, but we haven't uh, had the, you know, we need the right, the right contributor who has the right need to make those things happen. 
Um, recently, our project lead, who was Meet Gibbon, who started the project, uh, he uh, has decided to go on and do other things, and so we've moved to a steering committee governance model. So that's the last item on this slide. Where it, it changes our governance model a little bit, but honestly, we've never had to escalate anything to the steering committee because it's a pretty friendly place. So what have we been up to recently? Um, we just uh, released 1.11.1 not that long ago. Um, we have one new plugin in there and then enhancements to existing plugins. Um, as I said, we do some novel things, so you know, uh, some of the interesting things, uh, you see these, these plugins on here, things like a template allows you to sort of uh, dynamically generate records based upon the metadata that comes in on the request, so it's really things you don't normally see in a DNS server, so I'd love to have, um, have people play with those and see what they think. Um, I think that's it for the project updates. Yang, you wanna talk a little bit about service discovery and some of the ideas there? Okay, yes, okay, so service discovery is obviously one of my favorite topics. Your mic's not on. Oh, and I wanted to say before that, we do have a bunch of swag up here, so after the talk, you guys can come up and grab some and uh, uh, enjoy. Yeah, I, I want to discuss about service discovery. That's my favorite topic in DNS. Uh, many people probably ask, okay, service discovery by itself is so, so, sounds like interesting, but how is that related to DNS? You know, DNS seems to be pretty simple, right? It's a, a DNS record with just one string with IP address. What else do you expect, right? How, how is that DNS going to translate anything interesting into service discovery? But I want discuss that in several different angles. So first of all, why DNS still exist? You know, nowadays you have SDN, you have software defined networking that can define anything you like. You, you're not limited by like a side of rock. You, your IP address space can, can randomly assign anywhere you want, right? Everything can be, uh, if you want everything to be hard coded, you can hard code. You can say your web server is uh, 1.1.1.1 and inside of a company, it's probably gonna work if you want to do it this way, right? What's the point? What's the deal with DNS? The one thing that's very important with DNS is that one, DNS is a nice indirection. And this indirection is very flexible and it's something you definitely want. Uh, let's, let's talk about this way. If you have a corporate infrastructure and you want to make a change, you, even if you do a, let's say, a, software-defined networking, you hard code those uh, strings so that, hard code those uh, IP addresses so that people don't need to remember the DNS names, which uh, may sound like a DNS is getting uh, deprecated or out of favor, but in reality, changing uh, IP, IP in SDN is still going to be a lot more harder than changing DNS record. I mean, you change your DNS record, especially with the core DNS, that's just like one line of change, right, if you like. So that's why the DNS is still has a place. Secondly, uh, uh, DNS by itself is distributed in nature. Many people didn't realize. When people talk about the distributed system, people talk about REF protocol, <laughs> talking about uh, how big the system can be. But many people didn't realize that DNS is supporting a massive scalable uh, distributed system, that is the internet, right? The whole internet is backed by the DNS, right? So certainly it's a scalable and it's uh, uh, it's distributed in nature. Another thing that many people didn't realize is that DNS by itself is pervasive in your IT, even in your IT infrastructure. Here, I, I assume many people are coming from the uh, operations or DevOps or SIE background, but in IT space, the people still dealing with the DNS. Your, your corporate still has VPN. Your corporate may still have some internal website, and you have to manage all that. And, uh, What's the, you know, what's the communication channel in between those two worlds? Your customer outside and your internal uh, DNS, uh, internal servers. Actually, DNS make it very easy to manage both worlds. So that's why in nowadays, even with the uh, SDN, with all the advancement in Kubernetes, with all those things, you still see a place in DNS because it's just very pervasive in both the IT infrastructure as well as your DevOps website environment. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, John mentioned that Core DNS has a lot of uh, support on different protocols. Uh, one interesting uh, feature from Core DNS is the Cloud Sync. 
uh, syncing data, DNS record, from your local core DNS all the way to cloud. So how does that cloud sync matters? One, the when you use DNS, because DNS by itself is this way in nature, you actually can just forward your upstream DNS server to, let's say, the Google's 8.8.8.8, or uh, forward to, for example, Cloudflare's. I think Cloudflare is 9.9.9. .9 .9 .9 .9. No, it's, uh, it's 1.1.1.1, right? Anyway. But the cloud sync up from core DNS is different. Uh, core DNS, when sync up with uh, cloud vendors, Coding as we actually take the secure communication through ACP to the uh, to the cloud vendors uh, API uh, endpoint. So the communication is not done through UDP, which is less secure, but done through ACP with the proper authentication, uh, uh, with proper authentication and authorization. Uh, the cloud sync up with coding as is also handled with uh, TCP, and that makes uh, the the. Uh, the error handling, uh, a better place, and uh, the, the whole communication is much more reliable. And finally, the separation of data sync up and the DNS query is, uh, is a big deal because when you sync up with the cloud vendors, you don't want to, to be blocked by, by the path of your forwarding to DNS query. You actually can get the authentication, get the authorization, uh, get a record from the cloud vendor, uh, pull back into the DNS, and then into the core DNS and they expose the DNS uh, uh, locally to your, uh, 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 to your services that's uh, deployed locally. The local environment, the DNS communication with the UDP seem to be an okay thing, but if you want your DNS to traverse through the whole chain of DNS and go talking to your local DNS server, all the way going back to the cloud vendor, that can add additional paths, and that can cause uh, failures at any time, and that could be a very critical thing in your operational environment. Um, we, we talk about cloud sync up, and the one interesting, another interesting thing about CoreDNS is that CoreDNS can actually integrate with the multi-cloud. Uh, nowadays, when people talk about multi-cloud, there are several reasons for multi-cloud. One reason, obviously, is the data solvency and uh, data residency. You know, in certain countries, they may not want to share the data with another country, so you may be forced to say, okay, in certain countries, you, ha you have to choose a cloud vendor. That's may maybe different from the rest of the world. That's one thing. Uh, another thing that actually came to my attention is that when we talk about multi-cloud, we also, the, another reason for multi-cloud is also the MIA, uh, especially with the, the current uh, high interest uh, environment. Many companies you know, may have some uh, financial situations such as MA became you know, more active. In case of MA, if two companies or three companies combine together, you may not have a choice. You have to do multi-cloud. And you may not be easy to migrate from one cloud to another. I don't know if any, anyone ever moved from one cloud to another in, in the past several years. Raise hand. Oh, interesting. OK. How was the experience? <laughs> How was the experience of uh, migrating from one cloud to another? Okay, I, I think, I think I, everyone will agree that if the application or architecture of the, your service has been design, designed in a way, it's clear, it's rock solid, moving from one cloud vendor to another cloud may be a smooth experience, right? But that's unlikely to be the case if you're dealing with the MA situation, because in MA, you're always dealing with all kinds of legacy code no one wants to touch. Well, whoever wrote the code has already left a company, decided to go with some other interesting things, right? And, and in that situation, as an operation guy, the only thing you want to do is don't touch anything. Just leave alone, right? <laughs> OK, so that's multi-cloud. Uh, uh, um, uh, in, 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 in terms of um, Coding another thing is uh, coding also has diversified source information. As I mentioned, coding has consolidated both the customer information from cloud windows, from Kubernetes, as well as the corporate DNS servers that will serve the IT infrastructure. Uh, and the final point, people may be asking, okay, now, nowadays you have like uh, AWS or Azure DNS, and what's the deal with coding as? Do you still need a DNS server? I think you still need to consider that because even though, as far as I know, all the cloud vendors, all the three major cloud vendors already offered 100% SLA, uh, many people didn't realize what does that mean of 100% SLA. 
when we talk about the SLA, we have to think about the consequence. What if the SLA has not been met? What is for, it's not up 100%? If you look through the terms, the contract term, you're gonna realize the only consequence is that they will return the money back to you uh, during the time that the service is not available. Unfortunately, as I said, <laughs> DNS is a simple service and it's a cheap service. Okay, so the company I work for at one point had a major loss because the DNS server from one cloud vendor was down for several hours. As, as that caused certainly millions of dollars of loss, but the, when we talked to the cloud vendor, we realized the, the, the money we can recover is so small, such that they even offer option of gift card, Uber gift card. Yes, because they realize, that, yeah, for several hours, you only spend maybe like $100 in, in DNS. Okay, so do you want $100 to return back to your bank account, or do you want the Uber gift card? So make a good gesture, right? Yeah, that's a true story. Yes, <laughs> it's a true story I experienced. Okay, okay, uh, so I think I need to speed up a little bit. So that's one architecture we talked about uh, in the past uh, already, but I want to go over that. The one architecture, you can go over the multi-cloud with simple setup. You have a DNS server uh, on, uh, locally, that's a core DNS, and you, you have some infrastructure on both AWS and the Google Cloud. Now you're, you know, you either your corporate IT or your like uh, multi-cloud deployment you need to expose certain services from different, uh, you know, different places, different cloud windows. How are you going to achieve that? So this is one example where you are going to expose your DNS in a similar way, even though they are backed from different uh, uh, cloud vendors and the cloud DNS, uh, right? So I'm going to show a core file to, to make it happen. This is a core file that's actually going to work to achieve what I described in the previous slide. Uh, you only specify three sections. The first section is say, the raw phase three. You specify how your core DNS is going to talk to raw phase three to fetch a record. And uh, if the record is not uh, available in uh, RAW 53, you can set up the full through, uh, uh, full through line. That means the coding as will iterate through different plugins and they will full through to the next plugin, which is the Cloud DNS, which is the Google Cloud. Uh, they're gonna search for DNS record. Now you say, okay, so if your DNS record is still not available with the serv service you provide, it's not on Google Cloud as well, then you can fall back to your local DNS, core DNS to figure out where the, where the uh, service is, is located. Of course, it can be your corporate IT environment or you'll you have some internal services that you want to expose. Uh, I think, uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's some of the examples of how you can play with multi-cloud with service discovery. I'm going to hand over back to John to talk about the uh, demo plugin on core DNS. Great, thanks, John. Um, so, We've mentioned a few times that it's pluggable architecture. So one of the things you might want to do is create a pl plugin. Um, what we're going to go through here briefly, we have, I'll try and do it in six and a half minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions. Um, we're going to do a plugin where, uh, you know, whenever, whenever a DNS request comes in, there's certain information about it contains. And one of the most obvious things it contains uh, is uh, the, the source IP. That's something you might differentiate on. So in <laughs> so in, uh, you know, there's other information you might attach. I don't know how many people are intimately familiar with, DN with DNS, but there's other uh, extensions to DNS that allow you to attach other information. But it, everything, they always have a source IP because they always have to get the response back. And so um, what we'll do is a very simple plugin uh, that basically if, if the source IP is in a particular subnet, then we'll return one value. Otherwise, we'll return another value. This is a stupid plugin. You'd never do this because it's, you know, uh, but it's, it serves as a decent example. And, uh, well, I'll get to that later. Okay, so there's basically uh, just a couple of things you have to do to create a plugin. The first thing to understand is that, um, as Yang mentioned, Cordinus is configured with something called a core file. It's not a core dump, but it's a core file. And it's just a simple, uh, Cordinus was originally based on an early version of Caddy, which is a web server, and so the, it's the same format. And, uh, but, uh, or a slightly der derivative format of that. So basically each, uh, the core file contains stanzas for each zone, and then within each zone, you define which plugins you wanna enable and uh, 
uh, uh, uh, the specific configurations for those plugins. So when you're writing a plugin, the first thing you have to do is create a function that will parse that configuration and set, your, uh, set up your internal, internal information. So that's essentially what the setup function does. So typically that's in like a setup.go, like we're showing here. Uh, the init is like the module init. So if you're not familiar with Go, this is like, this is done at, uh, init is immediately called whenever the, the, the module is initialized basically at binary, the time the binary starts up, um, one time. And so that's used to uh, um, register the plugin with the caddy infrastructure that parses the configuration file. So it's basically saying, hey, I'm a plugin. If you see this keyword, invoke me. So you pass it your setup function and the, and the uh, directive to call. And then uh, caddy will call in, the, 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 the main server will call into your plugin if that appears in the, in the configuration file. It'll pass you the parameters for that. And you just populate your internal structures, whatever they are. So that's the setup.go, pretty simple. Uh, the, uh, then you have something that actually performs your request processing. So there's a serve DNS method. This is the only method you have to actually implement to, in order to, to, to create a plugin that, uh, to process your request. Um, and it, it just gets a, you know, it gets a request in and a response writer, a place to write the, the response back to in and, and does, its, does its thing. If it doesn't know what to do with it, like it checks, uh, am, have, uh, is this a request that is in a zone I manage? If it's not, it passes it down the chain. Or in the example Young talked about with fall through, fall through allows you to, to do that same process of like, do I manage this request? But even for a single zone. Normally, CoreDNS, a plugin manages and owns a zone, a backend plugin. But you can sort of divide that up with this fall through and say that, oh, this zone, uh, I, I manage some part of it, um, but I'm not going to manage all that. So even with Kubernetes, um, on reverse lookups, we do this. So reverse lookups, uh, the Kubernetes plugin needs to manage um, uh, uh, the, the service cider and the pod cider, if there is one, uh, if you're doing pod, pod IPs, a pod DNS. Uh, but the service cider, if nothing else. And on a reverse lookup, if it's something doesn't fall within the service cider, we want to kick it out to whatever else to do the reverse lookup. So fall through is used there, for example. Um, OK, so what are that? I, I took too much time on that. So init function, like I said, super simple. Register the plugin with the word demo and call uh, the setup function. So that's when it's parsing the config. It goes through the, the configs and um, adds itself uh, kind of to the, to the plugin chain. Very straightforward. Serve DNS. OK, we grab the, the we take a look at the request. Uh, and we decide, we, we're saying, okay, if the request is the, 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 the IP, the source IP is, starts with 172 or 127, then reply with this. Otherwise, use the 8888 reply, add that to our list of responses, and we're done. This is literally like, what, 20 lines of code to write that plugin. So plugins are super easy to write, and you only need to think about the specific functionality you care about, and you can just hand off everything else to the rest of the system to deal with. The core file ends up look like, looking like this. This is saying that this core file manages dot, so everything. Um, and so demo is going to handle everything. Um, and this is just how to run it. So if you pull this deck down off of, uh, off of uh, Sketch afterward, then uh, you can copy this out of here. So that's the link to it. And um, ah, I did it in five and a half minutes. Um, hopefully not leaving too many questions. Um, before we go to Q&A, uh, we'd love to have you come join in uh, if you've got a unique plugin. We have tons of external plugins. There's two classes of plugins. There's the ones that are built in to the binary that we build. Um, and then there are external plugins. But it's pretty easy. But plugins are not dynamically loaded. If you're familiar with Go, Go is not great at dynamically loading things. I mean, newer versions have it, but um, the, they're just compiled in. But it's quick and easy to compile, so you just add a line to a file, compile, and you've got your own custom core DNS with your plugin in it. And you can, the other, the other kind of gotcha is that the the plugin order chain is not related to the core file. It's related to the compiled in 
ordering. So those are probably the two biggest gotchas with doing plugins. And uh, so, but otherwise, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So thank you. And I think we can go on to Q&A. Any questions? You will get first pick of the swag. <laughs> no coffee. Yes, sir. I, I do want to ask one, but I, I have a genuine interest question. So, uh, in the profile, do I have to follow the order in which the, the plugins were compiled? Uh, ah, so the question is, in the core file, do you have to follow the order of the plugins? No. Uh, you can put them in any order, but when the request happens, the request will be processed in the order of the compiled in order of the plugins. So for example, um, uh, there's, a, the, there's a plugin you know, to handle files, so zone files, and there's a plugin to handle Kubernetes, and there's a plugin to handle Cloud DNS from Google, right? They're in a specific order. So the first plugin that gets the opportunity to handle the request is going to be the first one that, that's, that's compiled in in that order, regardless of the order you, d you enable them within the core file. And now you can grab something. <laughs> yes, sir. If, it might be better. I think it's recorded, so you probably should use the mic. That's why I repeated the question last time. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. Hopefully, they'll be quick. The first one is for the multi-cluster example. Are you putting that configuration in a separate core DNS that you're running outside your Kubernetes cluster, or just the one that comes with? So basically, your mic. So basically, when we talk about multi-cloud, you're actually talking about uh, your service that deployed into a multiple cloud environment mm -hmm. or your local cloud environment. However, your, your DNS is scattered around, but there's one core DNS that's sitting uh, at the central of information so that you can see through all the backend information like from Google Cloud or from the AWS or from Azure. So there's one place you can see as a source of truth. Yeah. Like it has nothing to do with the core DNS that's running in Kubernetes. Sure. It could be a completely, you could be running it in Docker, you could be running it right. on a, a hosted, like, and in fact, I would recommend that you don't do anything else in the Kubernetes. So we have a bunch of things like, like uh, external DNS, where you can, um, uh, external Kubernetes plugin, where you can take things that are uh, like, like your services or your external IPs on your, on your uh, Kubernetes services, and you can expose them via DNS. Even for that, I would recommend you run a separate because that way you don't threaten your internal cluster DNS with external traffic, which right. could overwhelm it. Yeah, that was interesting, because that was actually one thing that I immediately looked up was that plugin exactly. Um, so okay. That's interesting. Yeah, and then the second question I had is, we have a very kind of niche use case. We're using core DNS SRV records for service discovery between our multiple layers in Kubernetes. We have a desire to be able to set the, the weighting on a particular instance on the uh -huh. fly. Uh, do you know if there's anything off the shelf that does that in core DNS, or is that something that we would want to write a plugin for and just put in the chain after the Kubernetes plugin? Or um, so we have a few interesting plugins. I don't know if they do that off the shelf. We have one called Rewrite. I don't know if it can rewrite weights on SRV records. Um, it usually is for rewriting names and name responses, but there are some you can rewrite some headers. Like, so, like it, you should look at it. I'm. A, I'm not sure it does that. There's a template plugin that probably doesn't do what you want because you'd have to know everything up front. You could easily implement something. You might want to look at, there's a policy plugin. Okay. It's an external plugin, I think. But it actually allows you to um, do pretty sophisticated things. So we have this, what we call a metadata plugin, um, that if you enable it, it will actually um, kind of take the request and make information that's embedded in the request in weird ways available. So each plugin can kind of enhance the request with metadata. Mm -hmm. So for example, a Kubernetes plugin can add the service name, the pod name, the namespace, depending on what information you have. And then you can use that in later plugins in mm -hmm. the policy plugin, for example. Yeah, I was going to say that, because that was the next big thing is, if you were to write your own plugin, would you embed your own, essentially, Kubernetes client in there to get that information if you wanted to like put it on the pod as an example? Um, so that's actually so, an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah th there's a lot of tricky trickiness, and we can talk afterwards if you want about source IP based mapping to pod IP. Like, it's not as e it doesn't work as well as you'd hope. Put it that way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I had a question. Um, we run EKS, and lately we have had problems with core DNS timing out extensively. 
Um, I don't know if it's a CodeDNS problem or an EKS problem. So our workaround was using node local, local cache on each node. Okay. I was wondering, how do you deal with that kind of situation on EKS, if, if you're familiar with it? Um, let me, the, the, with the, the microphone's a little hard to understand. You, you're saying you have a, you're using we the node local the, DNS cache? Yeah, so we run into massive timeout on CodeDNS. So okay. our EKS cluster could not resolve anything. So we couldn't figure out what was going on. Right. You know, apparently it's a common problem in EKS. EKS and, and CodeDNS, there's a lot of people that have the same problem. Okay. Our solution was to use a no node local, uh, node local yeah. cache. Uh, that seems to solve the problem. But I was surprised that uh, CodeDNS had this issue with EKS. It, it's probably not CodeDNS. So there's a number of issues. We, we can look into there's, there's a few issues where, that we've seen over the years, although I would be surprised that we're still seeing some of them because they were related to kernel bugs and, and UDP timeouts in the contract table. Um, those are some of the, the really old ones. EKS has, depending on the kind of node you have, has request, you know, uh, network limits that in DNS world are really low, like 50K QPS, right? But, but in most people's circumstances, a node being 50K QPS is, is high, is a high number. But, but that, like, when we were doing testing back in Infoblox, I mean, even five years ago, it was like, we couldn't get, we couldn't get Amazon to nodes to deliver very good uh, um, DNS service because of all those limits. So there's a lot that can go into it. I'd love to maybe talk more afterwards. It's really hard without um, getting more detail, but you shouldn't run into, like the stuff that's served out of Kubernetes, it's literally straight out of memory. Yeah. You don't even need a DNS cache. It's like we're already have it in memory. The whole thing's loaded. It should be almost instantaneous. So it's likely a networking issue between, between there or a, UDP contract, like UDP, the entries in the connection tracking table in the kernel have to time out, whereas TCP, they get removed as soon as the connection's closed. Okay. And so that's why one of the things node local DNS does is it upgrades the connection from the node to the central core DNS to TCP so that it'll get, it won't run into these contract issues. Okay. So that's yeah, one of the. You, yeah, I, I don't want to add a couple of things, you know, based on at least my past experience. But now we see like one thing is the issue. Uh, I normally will look at the networking to make sure the, the, the path that runs from, you know, from your service or from where the DNS request happens can reach to the DNS server mm -hmm. and uh, try, try to diagnose with a networking issue because that's the most likely scenario. Uh, as, as John mentioned, DNS, uh, uh, that's one, one reason uh, we, when we do the cloud sync up, we use uh, uh, TCP. I mean, people may believe, okay, UDP, that's gonna be more efficient. But that's not necessarily the case because the UDP other than DNS, who else uses UDP? Okay, so optimization, uh, now the focusing on this area, in, in Linux kernel, in any place, people are focusing on TCP. So PTP normally have a high optimization, but UDP are falling behind. In fact, you cannot even find a lot of uh, UDP related software rather than DNS. Mm -hmm. That's why the, if there's any issue, it's likely going to be a networking issue or UDP related issue that's caused by kernel. But I, I mean, most of the time, unless you're doing something really massive. No, we're not. Or your DNS are serving some record in a very, I'm going to say TTO, very, very short TTO, you, it's very unlikely your, your DNS will be flooded. We, we tried a bunch of those, to increase CTL, increase cache, and yeah. a bunch of other things. Yeah. It worked for a while, then it started failing again. You mm -hmm. know, but I'll talk to you guys after the, after the presentation, so just to get more information of how we can solve the problem. Thank you. Okay, sure, thank sure. you. Sure. Hi there, I am a manager in a room of engineers. This might be a very stupid question. Uh, thinking of modern uh, practices by which engineers are developing um, DevSecOps platforms and consuming them, uh, one of the patterns that we see is uh, developers using bastions within AWS uh, on EC2s, and then we have uh, our DevSecOps workloads such as Kubernetes and Nexus running within cluster. As we have those resolving uh, with like publicly trusted certs, what is a method by which we consistently resolve those records both in cluster and out of cluster? Um, that might not be a plug-in question. If it's out of scope of this talk, I apologize. It's, I, for some reason, it's hard. Both, people are soft-spoken, and it's really hard to actually understand your, maybe because we're behind the speakers. Can, are you saying the, you're serving, you want to do DNS resolution for workloads that are in the cluster and out of the cluster? Um, workloads that are within the cluster. 
but provide that um, experience consistently. So let's say like Istio creates an uh, internal load balancer, it knows what it is within cluster and manage it, we can resolve that, um, or so that within like Route 53, we can register that within Route 53 um, through some manual operations to get ops flows. Uh, within the cluster as well, how do we manage those custom DNS records? Custom DNS records within, from within the cluster. Yeah. So um, I think you can do that, um, there's a couple of options. Right? So one option is you can create external name DNS or external name services, and then it just works as it does today. The other is you can use, um, you, th this is a case where you might want to use additional plugins within your Kubernetes DNS instance. I talked about not doing that earlier, but that was more because of external traffic coming into the cluster um, could overwhelm your, your cluster DNS and cause your things within the cluster to fail. But if what you're doing is things within the cluster need to get DNS access to things that don't live in the cluster, then these additional plugins would be just the right thing for it, I would think. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. I think we're over time. So thank you very much. Come and grab some swag. I don't want to take any home. So thank you.